this, this screen, this talk actually grew out of an experience that we had. We were in Paris with a group of students back in the 90s. And uh, one afternoon, we were sitting around in a garden with a colleague of mine from the history department. And we were uh, sitting around the table having drinks and talking. And my colleague shares, um, uh, collects postcards. So she was passing them around. And one of them she passed around was this one. Um, she didn't say what it was, but she passed it around. Um, and as she was passing it, um, it got to a young woman and the young woman said, what is this? And my colleague said, it's a picture of Notre Dame. And she said, in what way is this a picture of Notre Dame? And we tried to explain it. She just couldn't get through the idea that this was actually a picture of Notre Dame because of course, what she was expecting was something like this, a picture that actually looked like Notre Dame or this photo that Marjorie had taken, I think maybe even the same year. Well, that's a very small shift, but it was a huge jump for her. Now, fast forward, go to a, uh, go to a museum of modern art and the shock is even greater. So, you know, for example, how do we get from here? This is a uh, picture of a Russian village painted in 1889, kind of thing that people think about uh, as art. How do we get from there to here? Another picture of a Russian village done in 1923. This is like, you know, um, mind blowing. That's a huge jump. You know, there's a story about how if you take a frog and you put him into a pot of water, uh, if it's hot water, he'll jump right out. But if you put him into a uh, pot of cool water and you will slowly raise the heat, he'll never notice the difference. Well, um, I don't want to kill anybody or boil anybody. But what I want to try to do is to take us at least part way from the there on the left side to the here on the right side. So scientists and artists really both look at reality, they just interrogate it in different ways. And the four things that they always look at are space, time, matter, and energy. You know, the space is the region where the story takes place. The time is obviously the period when it takes place. Matter is the things that are put into this, this space. And the energy is the interaction between the objects in the space and maybe the artists. So scientists and artists both look at these things, but from different perspectives. Now let's go back to the prior to the 14th century. Art before then was just primarily religious in character. Um, figures were flat and formalized. Sometimes you'd see multiple scenes taking place in the same picture. There was no good way of rendering depth and people painted things the way they knew they were, not the way they saw them. And what I mean by that is we all know, for example, if you look at a road, um, we know that if you measured the distance across the road, it would be the same distance where you're standing as it was a mile away. But if you look at it, it looks different. And that was a big jump for people to make because they, they had it in their mind, this is the way things were. And so when they painted stuff, they painted things the way they were, not the way they appeared. Here's a good example. This is an icon of the Nativity of Christ. It was painted about uh, 1680, but icons uh, in the Eastern tradition are, are um, are, are copied over the centuries. So this is probably a pretty good copy of something that goes back um, maybe to the 13th century. Uh, we all know the story of the nativity of Christ. So in the middle is Mary having given birth with Jesus in his swaddling clothes. To her right are the shepherds shortly before the birth of Christ and the angels are announcing to them uh, that Christ is about to be born. On the left side are the magi who probably started traveling several months maybe before the birth of Christ. On the bottom right side um, are two uh, um, midw midwives taking care of Jesus shortly after the birth. And on the bottom left is the figure of Joseph just after he learns that his budding bride-to-be is pregnant. So in this one picture, there are, there are aspects of the story that go be before the central uh, narrative and after the central narrative. Um, people be prior to the, the Renaissance didn't really think too much about the linearity of time. Now, here's another one. This is from um, a, a, um, a manuscript in the um, Bibliothèque Nationale in France. Uh, I found this online, by the way. Uh, Merlin introduces Galahad to Arthur in the, ground, in the round table. With, there's the round table, okay? The artist knows that it's a round table, so he paints it as round. It's as if we're sitting up by the ceiling, kind of looking down on the table. Now we know if we were standing in front of the table looking at it, it would look flat like an ellipse, but he doesn't paint it the way he sees it, he paints it the way he knows it to be. 
The other thing is, if you look on the left side, the guy in the white gown, I presume, is Merlin, and Galahad, um, looking like he just had his hair permed, is right next to him. They are really the largest figures in the uh, in the painting. The knights around the table are also about the same size. But look at the serving people. Unless we assume they were all about nine-year-old boys, they're much smaller. Because in medieval times, what governed the, the size of a person in a picture was not how close they were to you or far or how far away. It was who they were, what their status was. So, um, and you can see that there's essentially no attempt made at, uh, at perspective because the idea of perspective had been sort of lost in the dark ages. So this is about the situation till about the 12th century. Where that begins, so that's essentially Euclid's geometry governed that. Everything was two dimensional. You know, there was an X, an X axis the height and the Y axis. Um, and there was no attempt to show depth or anything else. That began to change um, just prior to the Renaissance with Giotto. Giotto was a painter and an architect. And he's the guy who began the beginnings of perspective. If you look at his paintings, what he did was, uh, if, there were, if there were straight lines in the picture, if they were above your eye level, he would paint them going down toward the back of the picture. Anything below was going up above the picture. Now, how did he do that? Well, he imagined himself standing in front of the plane of a painting. And he said to himself, when you look at the painting, light from the, the, the painting converges on your eye. So if you take light coming from the four corners of the painting and it goes to your eye, it makes a pyramid. And his insight was that if he took the, uh, the line between himself and the center of the plane of the painting and then projected it back the same distance and connected the lines, he got another pyramid, an inverted pyramid. And if you erase the front pyramid, what you get is what we normally think of now as, as a perspective, okay? The, um, the vanishing point in the front of the picture define a three-dimensional region, and that's where the story of the picture takes place, and the artist or the observer is standing outside. But once he got to that point, it made it clear how, uh, how a painter could show distance by showing the height of people. So if you had a person standing at the front, he looked big, but as he moved back toward the vanishing point, he got smaller and smaller. That sounds like a trivial thing, but it was a really big invention. Here's an example of one of Giotto's paintings. And if you look at the woodwork above, uh, above the table, you can see that all the lines above the table are converging toward the bottom. And the lines at the bottom, like the lines of the table, for example, and the little uh, small table where the jugs are, are moving upward. That was a big change because what that did was it allowed artists to create the uh, illusion of three dimensions of depth. But even with that, if you look at his figures, his figures are still pretty flat. The faces looked, they looked like paper dolls were sort of pasted in. It needed a further development for that to, for that to, to change. Now, Renaissance art um, made a number of important developments. Prior to that, um, painters had to paint on boards, which were pretty heavy, or walls, which couldn't be moved, which meant you really couldn't paint outdoors. You had to work in the studio okay, or in the room that you were painting. They needed to develop perspective to really show three dimensions. Um, they had a favorite motif of, three to, of a pyramidal arrangement of figures. And the last two things uh, had to do with appearance that I'll talk about in a second. Um, now, what happened to trigger the Renaissance was that in 1453, the Ottoman Turks uh, overran Constantinople and conquered the Byzantine Empire. And that led to a, a huge outflow of uh, scientists and engineers and intellectuals to the West and artists. And they brought with them knowledge that had been lost to the West for hundreds of years since the barbarian invasions. So all of a sudden, it was like somebody took the Library of Congress and sort of dumped it into your, into your studio. Um, people were just overcome by new ideas. And all of these new ideas led to the development of what we call the Renaissance, which means, uh, which means rebirth. OK, what are some of the things that happened? Well, another painter, Leon Batista, Batista Alberti, who was a a painter and an engineer as well, and a mathematician, developed formal rules of perspective. He took Giotto's idea and he, he, he used mathematics to develop uh, detailed ways of depicting what perspective would look like no matter where you were in front of the scene, whether you were dead center in front of it or off to one side. Here's an example of one of the types of geometric uh, constructions that you would have done. 
Uh, if this brings back painful memories from uh, high school geometry, I apologize. Uh, but the point is, uh, you can see that setting up a painting to show re uh, perspective is essentially an exercise in geometry. And what an artist would do to begin with is he put maybe a base paint of uh, a base coat of paint on the on the uh, the canvas, and then he would etch all these lines into it, and then he would paint between the lines. So the picture was actually de uh, defined by all of these lines, and the function of the paint was essentially to fill in the lines. If you look closely at a lot of these paintings, you can actually see, you can still see the lines that he etched in them, how the artist etched in them. So what that did was it really allowed a faithful depiction of what a third dimension looked like. Paintings became much more realistic. Here's a really good example. This is a painter named Carlo Crivelli from 1486. Yeah, they, they, because of their uh, discovery of perspective, Renaissance painters loved to um, put lots and lots of um, architecture in their pictures to show how their mastery was. And if you look at this, you could see all these lines sort of converging toward the back. And if you were to take a ruler and a pencil and draw some lines along those, uh, those cornices and things, you'd see that they all, um, they all uh, converge right at the center. So this is a really great example of a, of, a, of a Renaissance painting that now shows fully developed perspective. The second thing was the introduction of the shadow. Again, you think, a shadow? You know, they didn't know about shadows. Prior to the, uh, the Renaissance, shadows, if they appeared in paintings at all, just were random sorts of things. But what uh, Piero della Francesca did was to reintroduce the, the shadow into, into a painting. And putting a shadow into a painting is really important because it does a number of things. Number one, of course, uh, the length of the shadow tells you what time of the day it is. If it's long, it's either morning or night, and you can figure out which it is by looking at the color of this, the light. If it's overhead, you don't see one. But the other thing that a shadow does is that it allows you to build up three-dimensionality in people as well. So here's a really great example. Caravaggio, this is uh, Doubting Thomas. Look at the shadows uh, in, in the uh, robe, for example, Christ's robe, how really it really gives you that, that sense of three-dimensional folding and the faces. It brings the faces out and gives them a solidity and a reality that uh, they would not have had without using those shadows. The other thing he did was to develop a technique called chiaroscuro, which is Italian for light and darkness. It's juxtaposing light and darkness and what that does is that it focuses your attention because obviously your, you look at this and your eye goes right to Christ's chest and then down to Thomas's finger in Christ's side. And the other thing that it does is that it heightens the, um, the emotional impact. So with those two things, with, you know, with perspective and with shadows, um, Renaissance painters could paint things of incredible reality. They could paint things that looked like they were taken with a, with a camera, even though the camera, as we know, it didn't exist. One more thing, I'm not gonna talk about uh, the Mona Lisa. Um, I want you, what I want you to focus on is just to the right of her head, our right, as you're looking at it. Um, the background looks kind of fuzzy. That's a technique that Leonardo developed called sfumato, which means essentially to become smoke. And Leonardo realized that when he looked into the distance, things became fainter, they also became fuzzier. Now. Thanks to 19th century physics and chemistry, we know the reason that they get fuzzy is because the light uh, is bouncing off the molecules of, uh, of air and dust, and that's why, it's caused, that's why it's fuzzy. Leonardo knew it, that if he walked toward the back, they would be just as sharp, but he had the courage and the insight to paint what he saw, even though it was not what he knew to be the reality. So that's a second technique, and you can see it here in this enlargement. Uh, not a very good picture, but it's the best I could find. Okay, that led to representational art, art that looks like pictures. And those tools were so powerful that they essentially dominated painting from about the 15th century to the middle of the 19th century. They, re they reigned supreme. The only, the only difference was that in 19th century France, in early 19th century France, and England for that matter, there were sort of two streams of thought about painting. One was the line theme. That's what we've been talking about that the picture is defined by all these lines and the color is there to kind of fill it in and make it three-dimensional. But there was another uh, school of thought uh, that said that color was important. That was a minor school of thought. In England, uh, a line person would have been um, constable. 
and uh, a color person would have been uh, would have been Turner. Um, oops, I skipped ahead. All right. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, hold on for a second. Okay. So um, pictures were painted in the studio, and they were painted in the studio for a couple of reasons. One of which is is portability, but the other one is that has to do with the availability of paints. Up until the time when oil paints became available, which was in the mid 1400s, especially, um, artists use egg tempera. So, you know, you took an egg yolk, you broke it open, you ground up your pigment by hand, you mix the pigment with the paint, you put the paint in a pot, and you painted with it. Well, you couldn't very well take, uh, you know, 16 pots and carry them out with you along with this, this wooden board you were painting on. So people tend to paint from stat in the studio from sketches, and that meant that the colors that they put into the sketch or into the painting were colors that they had remembered, not necessarily colors as they actually saw them at the time. And when they modified things, they modified them for emphasis like Taravaggio did, or for dramatic effect, or for to make a point, or to satisfy aesthetic conventions. And one of the ones I talked about was that, that uh, triangular motif. Here's a, a picture, the visitation by Ghirlandaio, painted in 1491. Um, again, you can see the uh, architectural stuff. You can see the background is kind of fuzz. And if you look at the figures of Mary in the green robe and Elizabeth in the gold robe, you can see that triangle. And you find that triangle a lot in, um, in Renaissance art. You also see distortion of figures. Uh, El Greco uh, was noted for the distortion of his figures. He was an interesting person because he was born in Crete he, so he was Greek, which is why he caught the name El Greco. And he was uh, trained as an icon painter. And then he eventually went to Spain and then to Rome, uh, where he made his name as a secular painter. This is the Holy Trinity. But if you look at the image of Christ, you can see how long and elongated his body is and how distorted it is. That's, that's done to heighten the dramatic effect of, uh, of his death and the love of his father who's sort of holding and wearing, by the way, incongruously a bishop's hat. Um, you see this kind of elongated figures other places as well. You see that in, uh, in Byzantine and Russian icons. But if you go, for example, to Chartres Cathedral and you look at the porches, uh, the sculptures that were done in the 12th and 13th centuries all have these elongated figures. And that's because they were modeling themselves on this ancient Byzantine art. Okay, so representational realistic art, its goal was to reproduce the appearance of time and Euclidean space in painting, to make it look as much like a photograph as possible. Although they, would, they didn't know what a photograph was. Now what happens is there are a couple, of, there's a revolution that takes place both in modern science and in modern art, and they both end up challenging those ideas in different ways, but they sort of work almost hand in hand. Now, in the 19th century in France, the, the, uh, the pinnacle of academic painting was the, uh, the historical picture. These are gigantic pictures. This, uh, this, the coronation of Napoleon, uh, which hangs among other places in, um, in Versailles, it's a gigantic painting. It must be 20 by 30 feet high. It's enormous, okay? And so if you could pull this off, you were considered to be at the apex of, of the ability, your ability to paint. So that's what people look to as the gold standard for I guess you call it coolness in painting in um, early, the mid 19th century France. The arbiters on the other hand of painting, whoops, skipped ahead. Uh, let me just go back for a second. Um, the other thing that was happening though in France in the 19th century was uh, and in, in general in Europe was a focus on an increasing focus on light. Newton back in the 17th century had discovered that white light could be decomposed into um, it's, it's various colored components. So white light was a superposition of a range of monochromatic components. That meant, for example, you could take, um, you could take primary colors and you could mix them to make secondary or tertiary colors. The other thing that, uh, the other idea, by the way, that um, Newton had was that light consisted of particles and not waves. Uh, that did not find favor until the late 19th century. But what comes out of um, Newton's work is most colors can be decomposed into mixtures of primary ones. In science in the 19th century, uh, chemists were discovering that the, the, um, the chemicals that made up the world were made up of a small number of elements that could be combined together in different ways. And so that same idea that 
there's a small number of simple things that can be used to create a wide range of other things, uh, it was in the air. Not only could you mix colors to make uh, other colors, but if you, if, if, you did, if you juxtapose them, if you put them together next to each other, you could also create the illusion of different colors. Okay, um, another person who you probably have not heard of, or you may have, is Michel Eugène Gevreux. He was the director of the Gobelin Tapestry Works in Paris, and he did a lot of work with color perception. So he was really interested in what, uh, what determined how we saw colors. Two ideas I want you to think about. One is called um, Chevreul's Illusion. Here's a picture. Each of those vertical bars is a single shade. It's a solid shade. There's no variation. So all the way from white to dark. But if you look at where they touch one another, you can see that it looks like the shade changes. So if you take a lighter shade and a darker shade and you put them next to one another, the darker shade looks a little darker where it is next to the lighter shade and the lighter shade looks a little lighter. That means that color is not an absolute, it's, it's perceptual. You can change the appearance of a color by changing what's near it. And the other thing was what he called the law of simultaneous contrast. If you take a color and you put it next to its complement, it becomes more intense looking. So for example, if you look at one of those squares, let's say the, um, um, the yellow one at the top left, gray is the neutral color. So on your left, you're just sort of looking at native yellow. But if you put its complement, purple, in the center, see how much brighter that orange looks, that yellow looks like? So you can, again, you can intensify or mute colors by what you put next to them. So all of this led people to the idea that color was a lot more complicated than we thought it was. The other thing that was going on at the same time were the revolutions of 1848. In 1848, all across Europe, there were revolutions because what was happening is that a middle class was rising up, a bourgeoisie, and they wanted, uh, they wanted to be released from the domination of the monarchs. And so revolutions uh, spread all, all across Europe and they all were quelled, but they were built on the idea of rejecting monarchical structures. And they tended to be led by skilled workers, family laborers, and middle-class liberals. The aristocrats were not interested in overturning the, uh, the status quo. Well, in art, in the 19th century France, the arbiter of fine art was the Academy of Beaux-Arts. And they had a salon that they had once a year, gigantic jury exhibit. And everyone was allowed to, to uh, submit material. If your stuff was juried into this salon, you had arrived because it was seen by all of the powers that be. It might be bought by a, a number of an aristocrat, might be bought by a museum. And if you were really lucky and it was bought by a member of the, imp the imperial family, you were really in the chips. Your, your, your financial troubles were over. Well, what happened was uh, a, a revolution triggered by Edward Manet. Manet was a classically trained painter and he could paint beautifully in this representational style. But in 1862, he painted this picture, music in the Tuileries gardens. I look at this picture and my first reaction is, this is a Where's Waldo picture. It's like all these people jammed together cheek by jowl, you can't tell who's doing what, there's no center or anything else. It's like there's no focus, you know? There's no vanishing point. So there are no straight lines in here, even the trees are curved. Now you have to know something about France. The French are the most precise people I've ever met. They like order and straight lines and trees in the, in the, in the Tuileries are not curved. They would have been yanked out and replaced with a straight one. So what, uh, my, what Manet is doing here is he's creating a picture that's designed to confuse people. There are no straight lines, there's no focus, there's no depth, there's no nothing, there's no story. People did not like this picture because it really bothered them. It offended their sense of order. Well, uh, Manet, Manet was uh, not a one to give up easily. Now he entered, now a year later, here's what he comes up with. Le déjeuner sur le, the, the luncheon on the grass. People went nuts when they saw this picture. Why? Well, first of all, here are these two you know, well-dressed gentlemen sitting there uh, for all intents and purposes, looking like they're having a conversation. And there's this naked lady plunked down right next to them with her clothes scattered all over the place behind her. And there's another lady behind her who's bathing in the spring. Now, um, people, as I said, people were nuts with this. Uh, they, they did not like this at all for a whole range of reasons. One, um, 
one um, critic said this. He said, this is two daubers attired in velvet who chat about aesthetics with a woman dressed only in her virtue. Its garish coloring pierces the eyes like a steel saw. His figure seems to have been cut out with a punch and have a hardness that is capable of no soothing compromise. It has all the unpalatability of green fruits that will never ripen. Now, okay, let's now what's right with this picture? Well, uh, one thing is he at least kept the triangular arrangement, the, the pyramidal arrangement. But other than that, he violated just about every canon of 19th century painting. Let's take a look at this. Okay, number one. Nudes, nude ladies had been around in paintings, you know, forever and a day, but a non-classical nude had to be a nice kind of either a nice God-fearing girl or a goddess or a saint or something like that. She had to be demure and sweet and non-threatening. This lady is not demure. First of all, her lighting on her is really harsh. Okay, she is sitting there staring at the camera or at the at the painter, like you know, what are you looking at? Okay, she's not nude. She's naked. You know, and the idea, it reminded me of a, there's a play called um, Tea House of the August Moon. It takes place in Okinawa. And the main character who's the, uh, the narrator is talking about the fact that some American um, GIs were uh, all uh, up in our, not up in arms, but excited about the fact that uh, the women in Okinawa went to the baths naked. And he said, I don't understand this. He said, in America, uh, if you see a naked lady, it's a scandal. In Japan, it's just, good breeding, it's good hygiene. He said, conclusion, pornography is question of geography. Well, so here's this lady and she's not a nude, which is okay, she's naked. That's the one thing. Number two, look at the figures. They look like a badly arranged um, still life. It's true that there were three of them, but no one is looking at anybody else. There's no interaction between them. The fellow on the right is talking, but the guy on the left looks like He's zoned out on something or he's completely uh, disconnected. The lady next to him is not looking at either one of them. And then the person in the back is oblivious to what they're doing. There's no story here. There's no energy of interaction between people. Second rule broken. Third one, multiple origins of light. Clearly the folks in the front are being lit almost like a floodlight from the front. And yet there's light filtering in through the trees in the back. How can light be coming in two, from two places at once? You know. People were just outraged. You know, basically, is he is he really uh, is he really uh, yelling? You know, giving us a hard time. And then the last thing is, there's no middle ground in this picture. Let's apply the rules of um, perspective to this, okay? And we'll sorry to do this. We're going to use this naked lady as our measure. So, if you imagine that you draw a line from the top of her head to the bottom of her rear end, okay, uh, that's that's the height of half her body. Now. Let's draw some other lines to the vanishing point, which is on the horizon. That red line, that up that uh, vertical red line is the height, the dis distance between her buttocks and her head. If you move that back along those two converging lines, that little red line is about how big she'd be if she was sitting back there. Now let's look at the other lady. Imagine that you draw a line from the top of her head to the bottom of her buttocks and then tip it up. You get the blue line. That's how big she would be. Well, if this lady in the front is five feet tall, the lady in the back would be about nine feet tall. So, and again, everything is wrong with this painting. There's nothing, you know, it's like that nothing holds together. As I said, people were not, not, not crazy about this. Well, Manet was never one to give up. So what he does next is he gives you his take on a classical painter. This is a beautiful Renaissance painting by Titian, the Venus of Urbino. This is a classical nude. This lady is, She's probably just come from the bath. She's lying on her bed. There's not an ounce of seductiveness about this lady uh, or sexuality about this lady. She's just sort of laying there, you know, and she's giving you this kind of little look. And behind her is this domestic scene unfolding, okay? Her, her maid is getting her robe or whatever, whatever she's gonna wear. And there's a little girl and there's her little uh, lap dog lying there adoringly curled up at her feet. Manet decides to paint something like this. And here's what he comes up with, bam. Okay, Olemp, same basic layout, but man, is it different. Okay, how is it different? Well, number one, this is not a nude, this is a naked lady. Okay, um, she's, and look at her face. Her expression is like, what are you looking at? And she looks like world weary and tired because in fact, the woman he painted was a prostitute. Okay, and she's uh, largely unclothed, but the little um, string around her neck 
and the um, the slipper on her foot just accentuate her nakedness. So there she is, and now behind her, instead of the uh, the faithful maid and the little girl, is this black servant lady who's bringing her a a, um, a bunch of flowers from a, from an admirer slash client. In 19th century France, I hesitate to say this, black people were considered to be hypersexualized. So putting a black woman there just heightens the fact that this is a painting that's filled with sexual content. And you can't see to the right, but there's no little dog there. So I'm gonna, what I did was I actually um, intensified this so you can see something better. You, do, you can see to the right is a black cat. And he's not lying there quietly and relaxing. He's arched up and his, his fur is standing up like he's in alarm. Black cats were also code for sex. So Manet creates this painting in which he completely remakes the Venus of Urbino. And again, predictably, people went nuts about this. So, you know, why would you let your daughter, would you let your daughter see this? Would you let your wife see this? You know, well, he began this revolution that eventually became Impressionism. Okay, I'm gonna skip over the Pfeiffer. Uh, just to save a little time. Now, Impressionism is one of these things, I say here, familiarity makes the revolutionary become banal. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, you can go to Walmart or you can go to Target and you can buy reproductions of Impressionist arts and college kids have them on the walls of their rooms and people have them in their dining rooms and living rooms in their houses. They have no clue how radically revolutionary Impressionist painting was because it's been around for so long. We just look at it and say, oh, this is really kind of pretty. Well, how does, how does it begin? Well, it begins with Claude Monet. Monet paints this painting, Soleil Levant, The Rising Sun in 1872. And if I had you, in, uh, if I were in front of you, I'd probably grab a couple of volunteers and say, tell me what you see. Well, uh, it's a harbor scene. You can see water and the rising sun reflected in the water. Up to the top left, you can see what looked like the masts of ships. Off to the, the top right, you can see things bent over to look like cranes. And then the front, you can see a couple of boats with fishermen going out to fish and the water is rippling. Um, except if you look at this closely, if you look at this little area right here with this boat in it, here's what you see, just some daubs of paint, okay? There is nothing in here that's representational, but what Manet does is he realizes that your brain puts these things together and he lets your brain tell you the story. Now, why does he do that? Well. The sun doesn't just sort of sit there. You know, you, I mean, if you're if you're one of these deliberate people who makes you know, it takes twelve hours to make a painting, you sit there patiently. Well, you know, in five minutes the sun's going to be all the way up. The scene will have changed, and Monet is trying to capture the moment. So he's painting as fast as he can, and he's for, he's foregoing detail for the image itself. Um, not surprisingly, it was not well received um, by the powers that be. Um, one critic. Descriptive. He said, this is not a painting. This is a mere impression. And the name stuck. That's where impressionism comes from. Um, now, remember, I don't uh, do this. You know, some, they've done studies. Uh, you can take words and you can make sentences out of words with most of the vowels missing. You know, um, and you can fill it in. It's fairly easy. You, you know, L dash V E. Yeah, L dash V dash. Most people would say love, you know, um, I don't know, whatever. That's, that's what the brain is doing here. It's doing that work of, um, of integration. I move this over so I don't keep looking to the right. The other thing, of course, is he's using vivid colors. The other thing that happened in the 19th century in chemistry, good old chemistry, was that organic chemistry was being developed and they began to develop a wide number of dyes that led to the development of the German dye industry. And what that did was it made uh, a wider range of colors available to artists than they'd ever had before. And along with that, in the 1840s, an American artist uh, came up with the idea of taking oil paints and putting them into tubes. And so artists didn't have to mix their own paint anymore. They could buy it in tubes and carry it with them. Art became portable. So artists could then go out and paint on, uh, on plein air the way, we, the way a lot of you do today. Okay, now. Impressionism, they painted in, on plein air, not in the studio. They painted because they were obsessed with the idea that what you were really looking at was light bouncing off things and they wanted to capture the moment instantly. You can do it with a camera, 
but you can only do it with, uh, with the painting if you work really quickly. The de de details were not usually shown explicitly, they were impl implied. Colors were really intense. And in a nod to that, that those revolutions that had taken place in the 40s, and they dealt with ordinary people and themes, and they were fascinated with fluidity. If you go to the Museum of Fine Arts and you look at their French Impressionist paintings, you'll realize how many of them involve water because water is constantly changing. And they were fascinated by the way that that, that happened. Remember I said, I talked about um, the, con the com competition between paintings that were based on line, which is the way the, uh, the establishment um, worked in the, in the 19th century. Here's uh, J.M.W. Turner, the British uh, artist, who was one of the first people to focus mostly on color. So Turner uh, lets color tell the stories. And that's basically what the Impressionists began to do as well. Monet painted 30 pictures of Rouen Cathedral at different times of the day to capture the different ways that the light made the, the cathedral look. The cathedral stays the same, but the light changes the appearance of it. And if you just take a look at, if I have it here, yeah, the top left one, the top left corner, if you'll take a look at that, um, oops, sorry. You can see that there are colors there that you would never really see. Monet puts primary colors in a lot of places where they're not there because he sees them in the light that, that bounces off them. Here's another one from the same series. Monet then goes on in his later life to paint water lilies. He was a fanatical gardener. In his home in Giverny, um, he actually diverted a river into his garden and he had a water garden. He had stands of bamboo and the beautiful water lilies. And he was obsessed with painting these things because he loved the patterns and the colors. And what he did was in painting pictures of water lilies, he would just eliminate the horizon. So that means again, no depth. You have water. You can see beneath the water, you can see the, the reflection of the sky above the water. So it collapses the third dimension. And as time goes on, his paintings become increasingly abstract. So here's one of them. Clearly, you know what you're looking at here. Here's another one, a little bit more abstract. Here's a third one. Here's another one. And finally, you get to fully abstract paintings. That was the beginning of the move to abstraction. After the Impressionists, come the post-Impressionists. They didn't, they, they painted slightly differently, uh, but they were kind of the descendants of it. They, uh, Cezanne particularly, painted in a number of different styles. But here's a good example. Um, this is one of his still lifes. Um, it's interesting for a variety of reasons. Look at the plate. So this plate of, it looks like apples and some kind of striped fruit sitting there. Think about that 12th century etching that I showed you before with the round, the King Arthur and the round table. We're looking at this plate as if we're looking at it from the top. So one of the perspectives is you're looking at this thing from a very, looking down from the top. But if you look at the table, it's clear that the viewer is looking at it from the front. And if you look carefully through this, you'll see that, that um, Cezanne paints a whole uh, different parts of it in, in a variety of different perspectives. He's trying to show uh, all of the aspects of this in one, in one place. The other thing is, if you look at the table itself, the two halves of the table don't line up. So he's also playing with space. So he's playing with perspective and he's playing with space. Out of that grew this idea that you could, um, you could mimic colors by juxtaposition of colors. So one of the other schools that grew up was pointillism, in which people use tiny dots instead of lines to color them. The classic picture is uh, the Sunday afternoon on the Isle of La Grande Jatte. If you look at this picture carefully, what you'll see is that there are no lines here. There are, everything is dots. It's tough to see here, but another one of Surat's, oh, by the way, I should tell you, people were so uh, angry with this painting, they had to put a guard in front of it because people were attacking it with their umbrellas, which I think is ironic considering what the ladies are carrying. Uh, here's another one of his paintings, uh, the parade at the circus. If you look at the man on the, in the box on the right, you can see it, it's clearly, a, it's a portrait of the person, right? If you blow it up, here's what you see, okay, just, primary and secondary colors put on painstakingly with dots. And they actually create the impression of solidity. When you get close, you see chaos. When you back up, you see a painting. Here's another one, Paul Signac, Capo di Noli. 
Now he's not using dots. What he's using are uh, dabs, dashes of, of color. But again, same kind of thing, okay? Uh, they've oh. abandoned the line almost completely in, in favor of color. Okay, next group, the fauves. Uh, the fauves now are, what's happening is things are shifting toward depicting colors as they actually are and more toward the way they see people, the way they seem to people, the emotional content. And the logical, uh, the logical growth of that is fauvism. The fauves were into color in a big way. Uh, Vlemings, the scene of Chateau just screams color. It just, it's kind of punches you in the eye. Now, I don't think there are too many bright orange trees in the world, for example. Uh, but that's, but Vleming was not really concerned with uh, photographic accuracy. He was trying to create a sense of the emotional um, response that this created in him. Well, the Phobes had their first exhibit in a large hall. And in the middle of the hall was a statue by Donatello, the, the, uh, re the um, Renaissance sculptor. And one, uh, one critic stomped out of the museum and he said, uh, and he, he was just insulted by this whole thing. And he really felt that they were, they were insulting Donatello by putting his junk up there. And he said, as he walked out, Donatello chez les fauves, which translated from French means Donatello in the midst of the wild beasts. And that's where the name comes from. The fauves had such like intense colors. Pregnant women were warned not to go to these exhibits because, they were, because of fear that they would hurt the baby. Um, uh, uh, Vleming told his wife not to go because he was afraid she'd be, a, she'd be attacked. So these are the fauves. M Matisse also painted that way. And you can see here, these, these are great, these are beautiful portraits, but they're very simple, very simple colors, very simple shading. His wife, Madame Matisse has a nice green stripe running down her nose. Um, he's really trying to, to give you some sense of how he saw her not externally, maybe, but internally. Of course, everyone's famous fa favorite post-impressionist, Vincent van Gogh, paints Starry Night in 1889. As a chemist, I love this picture. Um, and I love the picture because in the 19th century, one of the branches of physics and chemistry that was beginning to develop was called kinetics. And the idea was they just realized that what looked like the solid things around us, like you know the, the slab of marble on your table talk, on your tabletop, or the I suppose the uh, I don't know the car with the you know, the Christmas bow sitting in your driveway, that they were composed of molecules and atoms that were in constant motion, that the air in the room around you consists of these particles flying around at thousands of miles an hour, that this this turbulence that you can't really see, and um, and Van Gogh paints this turbulence. So it's sort of like a, uh, almost, I don't think he did it as an intentional uh, bow to the kinetic theory of matter. But as a chemist, I look at this and I can't think of anything else. Okay, now fast forward to 1954 surrealism about which I'm not gonna say a whole lot, except that I think this is one of my favorite paintings. Dali's, it's called Christus Hypercubus. It's the crucifixion of Christ, unlike any crucifixion you've ever seen, okay. Number one, Jesus is floating in the air, okay? Um, they're uh, in front of what looks like this weird shaped cross. Well, that the hypocubus part is because this cross, what looks like a cross is really what's called in mathematics, a four dimensional hypercube. It's what a cube, it's an attempt to make, to picture what a cube looks like as it exists not only in space, but also in time. And by putting Christ's figure in the front of this thing, what he's really saying is that the crucifixion was something that trans that 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 uh, so what I'm thinking of that went beyond space and time. That it was a universal event, and that's why he, he uses this. A uh, really great example of uh, of how do you can use something to illustrate a kind of mystical perspective. Finally, another one of my favorite paintings: painters Marc Chagall, The Birthday, 1915. You know, first time you see something like this, you think, what is this all about? Well, one of the other great things that happened in 1905 was that Einstein um, developed a theory of relativity. And one of the things that he did was he completely rethought the idea of gravity. You know, we think of gravity as a force between two particles, two things pulling them together. And he said, no, no, gravity is not a force. 
gravity is a function of the curvature of space. So a little thought experiment. Imagine you have a rubber sheet and you stretch it out and it's perfectly flat, okay? If you roll a, a BB across it, it rolls in a straight line. Now, if you take a baseball and you stick in the middle of it, of course, it sinks down. If you roll a BB across it, the BB goes down. When it hits the lower part, it comes back up again. It looks like it's being attracted to it. And Einstein said, things, objects, curve the space around them, okay? And that's what creates the attraction. Well, think about this. Great people in, in, in history, you know, whether it's Martin Luther or Albert Einstein or Mother Teresa or, I don't know, Tom Brady, curve the space around them. And that's what draws people to them. Well, what happens when you're in love? When you meet someone who you love, they have, they have it's, it's sort of like they, they curve the space around them and you just kind of curve around them. And the two of you kind of dance around one another. You know, if you look at, uh, if you listen to astronomers talk about the way planets move, when the earth revolves around the sun, it's not really revolving around the sun. The earth and the sun are revolving around one another as that kind of dance. And that's what happens in love. And so Chagall shows this by this idea, again, I don't know if he meant this or not, by the curvature of space in this whole notion of the fact that love is a dance. Okay, where does this bring us to? Well, it brings us to Pablo Picasso, okay? Um, this is a, uh, by the way, this is not a painting. This is a collage called guitar. Uh, and if you look hard, you can see pieces of the guitar here. And I remember looking at one, something like this, and I got an insight from my beloved wife. Marjorie was one day, she was reading an article in the Boston Sunday Globe. It was about schizophrenia. And they said, if you're a person who's schizophrenic, it's like the pieces of the world don't have any relation to one another. You know, where somebody might look at a watch, somebody else will see a spring over here and a wheel over here and so on. And your mind normally puts those things together and assembles them into the idea of a watch. What Picasso has done is essentially to deconstruct what a guitar is into its components, and then he reassembles them. So uh, it's like the kind of work that your brain does. It, it senses things from reality, it segregates them into different things, and then it puts them together, and that's what creates the image that we have in our minds. And the great painters like Picasso have, are, the, are people who have the ability to kind of step back before that process takes place and, and show what reality looks like without that. Final thing, Albert San Giorgi, another chemist, um, in uh, St. George, he discovered vitamin C. And, uh, and he said, I used to have this hanging over my office in my lab. Discovery consists in seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. If you look at the, pick, the uh, great artists that we've been talking about, isn't that exactly what they do? They look at the world that we live in and they think of it in a radically different way. And why did they do that? Well, scientists and artists are both people who are obsessed with figuring out um, what this world, what the world is all about. Last picture, favorite, another favorite of mine. I have lots of favorite pictures. Gauguin's, uh, this is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, okay? What are we, where do we come from? Where are we going? Those are the three fundamental questions. I think that at one level or another, everybody asks, every scientist, every novelist, every artist. But with the problem with science is you get to a point where, um, you're dealing with things you can't put into equations. You know, if somebody said, write an equation for why you love your wife, if the person actually gave you an answer, I think they need some therapy. Uh, because when you get to, uh, to confronting those questions, the only language that makes any sense, you know, it's just like saying, when you look at a, an abstract painting, you say, what does this mean? Well, if you listen to a piece of music without words in it, you don't say, what does this mean? You just listen to it. And, and you, you kind of apprehend it with, a, with the eyes of your heart. And the languages that are ad adequate to deal with those things are the languages of the artists and the poets and the musicians and the mystics. So um, if you think of it from those terms, these pictures are not bizarre pictures. They're attempts for people to grapple with the unknown. And I think I better stop here because I probably worn you out by now. So thanks for your patience, folks.